Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 3rd, 1991, Wayne Gretzky scored his 700th goal becoming the fastest and youngest player in NHL history to accomplish this feat at the age of 29 years and 342 days. Then, about a month and a half later, the Great One found himself wrapped up in something else that was a little bit fast, this time on the gridiron, and it all revolved around the player with the nickname Rocket. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, we traveled all the way back to 1873, and we're in Toronto, Canada. This is back further than, maybe not, it's not the furthest we've ever gone back in time with our DeLorean, but it's definitely further than I think we've been to in a while. But this is for good reason. Because this week, we're going to talk about the Toronto Argonauts, and one of what this week's guest calls the craziest seasons in football history. Speaking of history and football, let's just say the Argos definitely have a long one, as they were formed in the date that we came back to in the DeLorean back in 1873, and are the longest running franchise in North America in professional sports using the same team name. And even though the team is that old, this week we talk about more recent history, the 1991 season. Something that this week's guest shares is possibly the craziest in football history. He even wrote a book about it called The Year of the Rocket, John Candy, Wayne Gretzky, a cricket tycoon in the craziest season in football. We'll get into the book and the story here in a bit, but first, let me introduce you to our guest. His name is Paul Woods, and Paul Woods is an author, journalist, news executive, and historian of the Toronto Argonauts. He held a variety of senior roles with the Canadian Press News Agency, served as executive editor to the Toronto Star, and is currently executive director of Canada's National Newspaper Awards. In 2012... To 13, he was Rogers Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Journalism Faculty at Ryerson University. Woods is the author of two previous nonfiction books, Bouncing Back, From National Joke to Grey Cup Champs, and Bees in Sequence, The Lewis Craft Story. Now you're going to go ahead and hear about Paul talking about his love for Argo history and how he has one of the greatest collections of Argo memorabilia in this episode. And before we get there... This is a perfect time to give this week's sponsor some love. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Now I'm telling you, if you have not checked out Row One, do yourself a favor. 
pause this show, mash that little button, and go check it out real quick. We're getting close to the Christmas season, I'm telling you. There's some incredible Christmas gifts over there for your sports-loving friends and family members. Now remember, to get there, like I said, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash row one. That's R-O-W and the number one. Okay, now that you're back, and bookmark that page. I mean, you did bookmark that page, right? So you can keep going back there for your Christmas gifts. We can get on to the giveaway section on the show. As with many of our guests, Paul is going to give away an autographed copy of his book. You can sign up for your chance to win over at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. But with that, let's get into the interview with Paul Woods. That's the premise of the show is you're going to head back in time in my DeLorean with me and we're going to go for this. We're going to go back to 1991. But I think let's go ahead and set the stage first. Let's go a, a little bit before 1991, before what we call the craziest season of football history and kind of what was happening before that season. Yeah, that's a great question to start, Arnie. I mean, you know, the Canadian football was uh, a much bigger deal in Canada back in the 60s and 70s than it, than it is now. It was, I wouldn't want to say it was on a par with the NFL, but in some ways it was. I mean, you know, the uh, the Argonauts in particular, the Toronto Argonauts, the team that I've been following since I was a kid, uh, and the Montreal Alouettes to some extent, were able to outbid the NFL for big names from time to time back in the 70s. Uh, You know, Joe Theismann, everybody remembers Joe Theismann as the the, the Super Bowl winning quarterback for the Washington football team, Uh, had many, many great seasons in the NFL. His first three seasons were played in Canada with the Toronto Argonauts. He came out of Notre Dame. He was a runner up for the Heisman Trophy in 1971. And instead of signing with the Dolphins who drafted him, he came to the Toronto Argonauts and played three years there. Some of your your listeners probably, if they go back far enough, might remember the name Johnny Rogers. He was a superb uh, kick returner at uh, Nebraska. I'm pretty sure he won the Heisman Trophy in about 73, I think. He didn't come, he didn't go to the NFL. He came to the Canadian Football League, played with the Montreal Alouettes. The Argonauts actually uh, stole away from the St. Louis Cardinals, a guy named Terry Metcalf, whose son has been a star in recent years in the NFL. But Terry Metcalf led the NFL in all-purpose yards in 1976 as a running back slash kick returner in St. Louis, came to the Argos in, sorry, in 78. Yes, yeah, so it might have been in 77 that led the league, led the NFL. Uh, the Montreal Alouettes signed Tom Cousineau. He was a linebacker out of Ohio State was the number one pick in the NFL draft, I think in 78, came to Montreal. Toronto signed Bruce Clark, a defensive tackle out of Penn State, uh, was the fourth pick overall by the Green Bay Packers, came to Toronto in 1980. So in that period, the Argos and the Canadian Football League were, particularly in the two big cities of Toronto and Montreal, they were competitive with the NFL. And of course, you know, there wasn't the the, the media world that we live in now. We got some NFL games on TV up here, but not a lot of them. And if you didn't, if you didn't live near the U.S. border or you didn't have cable, you didn't see NFL. Uh, so Canadian football was a big deal. And, you know, we think of Toronto as a as Toronto is a big city. It's probably the third biggest city in North America behind uh, L.A. and New York. I think it's bigger now than Chicago. It's always been a hockey. Canada is a hockey country. And Toronto, of course, is the Toronto Maple Leafs, one of the most storied franchises in hockey uh, history. But the Argonauts and the Maple Leafs were kind of on a par back in the the 1970s. Uh, Then the Argos and the CFL began began a decline. Through the 80s, interest started to to get lower and lower. Uh, And so that's the context for what happened in 91 when they shot the football world by, first of all, three very famous individuals bought the Argonauts. Bruce McNall, Wayne Gretzky, and John Candy. And two months later, they outbid the NFL for the for Rocket Ismail out of Notre Dame, who would have been almost certainly the number one pick in the NFL draft. Uh, he was the biggest star in college football for the three years that he was there. He was the biggest name heading into the NFL draft. And on the day the draft was going to be held, he signed with the Toronto Argonauts. So there's your context. On the same day as the draft, he signed, huh? Yeah, same day. It was crazy. It was very brilliant strategic maneuver by by uh, Bruce McNall and his and his his colleagues in the ownership group because you know they they actually they finalized the deal. It'd been rumored that he was going to sign with Toronto for a while, and at first nobody really took it very seriously because 
by then there was no way the CFL could outbid the NFL for for any talent. The the the, the salary disparity had had gotten way bigger in the NFL and between the NFL and the CFL through the 1980s, partly because of the USFL came along and drove prices up um, and for various other reasons. And so, you know, the CFL had a salary cap of $3 million per team in 1991 for, for all players combined. And, you know, guys had signed the last two first round picks, the first overall picks in the NFL had been uh, uh, Troy Aikman and Jeff George, two quarterbacks who both signed for more than a million dollars a season. So the idea that the CFL was going to outbid the NFL for a draft pick seemed ridiculous. But McNall and the group got into the discussion with Rockets agents. And the next thing you knew, they were they were negotiating a contract with them. The contract was signed. This is such a brilliant PR move. The contract was signed on a Saturday night. And, of course, McNall came to fame as the owner of the Los Angeles Kings of the National Hockey League. The Kings were in a playoff series against the Edmonton Oilers uh at that time this was in april of 91 so there's a playoff game happening i think it was in la at the fabulous forum on a saturday night rocket signs his 24 page contract during the game and the next day they have a news conference in la to announce the signing and at the same time the news conference was happening or shortly shortly before the news conference or actually shortly after the news conference the NFL draft kicked off on ESPN. It wasn't the draft wasn't the three day extravaganza that it is now, where Thursday night is round one and and Friday night is round two, and it goes on into the weekend, goes on forever. It was a one day event back then. Sunday morning, the NFL draft comes on at ESPN, and Chris Berman has to very glumly open the show by telling his viewers. The number one star of this draft is off the board. Rocket Ismail has flown to Canada. And they had Rocket come on the draft. They had Bruce McNall on the draft. It just completely put a damper on the NFL draft. Russell Maryland ended up getting drafted by the Cowboys as the number one pick. But it was all built up. It was going to be built around where this is the next big star, Rocket Ismail. And suddenly Rocket Ismail is signed to play above the border. Yeah, that's a uh, timeline of events. Just imagine being that top team thinking you're going to take them. But I guess if the Cowboys took Maryland, was was that, when did Emmett Smith start in the league? Was it late eighties or early nineties? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would have been later because uh, I know Aikman came in, I believe, in eighty nine. I don't think it. I don't think Smith was there maybe until the following year. But I, you know what, I'm not hundred percent sure about that. Yeah, I mean, I could always go back, like I said in that DeLorean, yeah. we could go take a look. But before we get into that crazy season and all the, the – okay, again, this is a story that as I kept going back, I'm like, wait a second. Well, no, no, this is this is crazy. This, You know, that's the good term for you to use. You said Terry Metcalf's son is in the league. Are you referring to DK Metcalf? I think it's Eric Metcalf, actually. I think he's. I don't think he's in the league now, but Eric Metcalf was Terry's son. Okay. He played for a number of years back. Maybe it's going back a decade or so now. It's been a while. Okay, yeah. Eric Metcalf, he was a cornerback. I know like Falcons yeah. and some other teams. Okay, and, and yeah. I was yeah. thinking the timeline there. I was like, wow, I did not realize DK Metcalf's dad was that. So yeah. now that's not the timeline. Let's get into right. the other timeline, yeah. the craziest. Okay, the book subtitle, The Craziest Season in Football <laughs> History. That's a pretty bold statement. So <laughs> it is, I mean, and you know, and it, I mean, it's, I, you could probably argue that there were some other pretty crazy seasons over the years, right? I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff has happened in sports and in football, but it's certainly from a Canadian football perspective, there's never been anything like what happened in 1991 and there never will be anything like it again. I mean, just the, just the fact that they outbid the NFL. Yes. They, yes, they brought in Joe Theismann and Bruce Clark and Tom Cousineau and those guys back in, back in the days when money was way smaller and it just wasn't the business that it is now, but it's never going to happen again. And they not only, they not only outbid the NFL for rocket, but they paid him more money than any football player in history had been paid. The highest paid player in the NFL in 1991, as far as I can find out, was Joe Montana, Super Bowl winning champion for the Super Bowl championship quarterback for the 49ers, Hall of Famer, legendary quarterback. He was making, I believe, three and a half million dollars a year. Rocket was paid four and a half million dollars a year. So he was making Rocket was making one and a half times as much as every single teammate of his combined. They're all making three million. He's making four and a half. Uh, it's it, that that alone makes it crazy. And then you get John Candy and Wayne Gretzky and some of the stuff that happened to the Argos that year. We can get into it, but it was it was a wild year for sure. A wild ride. 
Yeah, it seems like something that I, again, a story I had never heard of, but going back, I was like, man, this happened in my lifetime. I was not really old enough to know what was going on at that time. But to think that a player, like you said, one and a half times the entire combined, the remainder of the players, is that a similar situation? Okay, back in the day, I'm going way back NFL. Red Grange comes and he like basically puts the NFL on the map. And he was making that same kind of comparison right there. I mean, what were the players like or the league? Was Were they on board with this? Yeah, they, I mean, there, there was uh, there was other teams. The ownerships and, and the management of other teams were very worried about it because the league was not on sound financial footing by that time. By 1991, there were a lot of franchises in the Canadian Football League that were in pretty rough shape. The Montreal Alouettes that – who, you know, six years earlier, they had brought up Vince Ferragamo after he'd led the LA Rams to the Super Bowl. The, the Alouette signed him. They signed Billy White Shoes Johnson from the Houston Oilers. They signed James Scott from the Chicago Bears. They signed two NFL first round picks. That was in 81. By 87, they were gone. The team was, was folded. So that, that was one sign that the things were not going well for the CFL in the 80s. Uh, there were other teams that were on the brink of disaster. Calgary Stampeders came close to folding in 85. Other The Saskatchewan Roughriders, who, you know, people that follow Canadian football now, they think of them as the cash machine of Canadian football. They're the, they have the biggest fan base and they produce the most revenue, even though they're in the smallest city. They're kind of like the Green Bay Packers, I guess, of, of Canada. They, they, they operate in a pretty small environment, but the whole province, which is the our equivalent of a state, the whole province loves the Rough Riders and they just, they sell that place out every, every game and they, everybody's wearing green jerseys and so on. But back in the late eighties, they had to hold telethons to, to get enough money to get through the next season. And so things were in rough shape. And so, you know, the, around the league, the owners of the other teams and the managers are going like, this is, we can't afford this. This is going to, this is going to cause all kinds of problems. The players, for the most part, were, were, in, were on board because they wanted Canadian football to succeed. And they thought, this is our ticket. This is going to get us on the front pages of the newspapers. This is going to get us bigger TV deals. I mean, it did get them. I mean, the day Rocket signed, the next day, the Monday after that, that NFL draft thing that he, where they where they blew that to smithereens. Front page of the New York Times, Rocket Ismail signs in Canada. Front page of USA Today. Front page of a, a, a short-lived national sports newspaper called The National. It was on ESPN. It was the biggest. It was the biggest sports story in the world that day, and it might have even been the biggest story of any kind in North America that day. So players, for the most part, even though Rocket was going to be making tons more money than them. They all thought, hey, you know, what is it like? What do they say uh, 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 about the boat rate rising? Oh, the, the, water? the ships rise with the tide. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Right. So they were all thinking, I mean, some guys were jealous and there were guys that wanted to hit them. Right. There, were, there was there was a kind of a competition. Who's going to be the first guy to tackle this guy? But they all, for the most part, thought this is a good thing for us. This will have a trickle down effect, to use a Ronald Reagan phrase. We're going to all benefit because more money is going to flow into our league. It didn't work out that way exactly as it turned out, and we can get into how this all played out. But uh, the players were not really opposed to it, and I think they, you know, they certainly respected the guy's talent. He was an incredible talent. Uh, but there were you asked the, the general manager of the Calgary Stampeders the day after, and he'd be going, "Oh my God, this is the death of the of the league." Yeah, I mean, you're talking that was right around the same time a year or two later, the Reggie White. I mean, he was the first big free agent in the NFL, and then they had moving on from there. Was there a free agency in the CFL back then, or was it a different structure? You know, it's it's very interesting question. Uh, they there you you there there were free agents, but there was a gentleman's agreement that they didn't touch each other team's free agents. Uh, you know, you we're all, we'll stay away from yours, you stay away from ours. It got violated. I think it was two years before Rocket arrived. One downtrodden franchise, the Ottawa Rough Riders, went on a spending spree and signed six or seven big name free agents from other Canadian football teams and paid them way bigger money than they could have expected to get under the old gentleman's agreement. And that kind of started the floodgates a little bit. And after that, we, ever since then, we've had we've had free agency and teams or players change hands all the time. But at the time, it was it was just kind of in the early stages. So you sort of, you know, you recruited your, your team, you stuck with them. You might bring in some, when NFL teams cut, had cut down in August, you bring up some talent because that's mid part of our season. And if you can upgrade out of position, you would do that. 
But it wasn't like it is now where free agency is a big deal and, and players love to, to, to change hands. It's actually quite an, an irritating thing about Canadian football. It's it's uh, People often say the NFL, you don't get to know the players because they don't stay very long. It's worse in Canadian football. Players go from team to team to team to team. You could, Don't buy a jersey with a guy's name on it because he's not <laughs> going to be on the team next year, right? Yeah, it sounds like every jersey I buy, except for my old school, you know, the the uh, Barry Sanders ones, I probably had a million of them. And uh, you, you mentioned the whole, you know, gentleman's agreement, it reminded me of and there's some other kind of qualities, I'll say that remind me of the AFL NFL battles, because there was the I think I'm going to butcher his name, Pete Gogolak, I think was the yeah. kicker. So yeah. it, it just kind of that same kind of concept. And it, it reminds me of like, uh, geez, I can't think of the, the number one running back, but Billy Cannon, I think maybe is was his name for the, yeah. the yeah. Oilers. Yeah. yeah. So there's like sim- similarities, but obviously the CFL was way longer than the, you know, it wasn't a startup that's older than the NFL kind of deal. So yeah, we've been, well, the Argos have been playing football under that name since 1873, right? Like they, they, Canada was six years old at the time and the U S hadn't even turned a hundred. Uh, so it's a century and a half of football under the Toronto Argonauts banner, the Canadian football league, as we now know it was formed in the late 1950s, but there have been teams playing each other with the same name for, for decades prior to that. Our championship game, the Grey Cup, was first awarded in 1909. The Super Bowl was 1967, I think, right? So we we got a 60-year head start on the NFL in some ways. And, you know, we just to, just to sidetrack for a second, I mean, Canadian football teams used to play exhibition games against both NFL and AFL teams back in the 60s. Uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, it, you know, one of these weird weird little obscure things that there's not much of a record of, but you know, the Hamilton Tiger Cats played the Philadelphia Eagles and, and the Toronto Argonauts played the Chicago Cardinals and things like that. It was when the NFL would be an exhibition season and the CFL, because it had nine teams, there was always a team that had a week off. And so they would, uh, they would have a, they'd have a bye week and they'd play an exhibition game against an NFL team. And then there was a fair bit of cross pollination, right? There was a, a legendary player in Canada called Cookie Gilchrist, a running back, who ended up going to the Buffalo Bills and became a legend with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, so there was that happening back in the days of the NFL, AFL wars of the 60s. But it, for the most part, the leagues kind of operated independently and sort of cooperatively. Every now and then, you know, the, the Argos would piss off the NFL by signing Joe Theismann or signing some other big name player. But for the most part, they were kind of different. The, the sport's a little bit different, right? We play three downs. We have 12 men on the field. We've got a 110-yard field. And for many, many years, we had 25-yard end zones. Now they're down to down to, t- to 20. Uh, and there's different rules, different kicking rules, a lot of other different clock rules. So even though it's football, you're, you're blocking, tackling, passing, running, punting, kicking. Uh, in some ways, it's a different breed, breed of football. And there are guys that could be a big star in the NFL that wouldn't succeed in Canada and vice versa. Yeah, that's something that – so we have a show called Truly the Goats, and he covered King Kong Mosca, <laughs> Oz Davis. I'm not sure if you <laughs> – Yeah, yeah. Angelo Mosca was one of the great the greats of Canadian football, and, of course, he was King Kong because he was a wrestler as well. And, of course, Mose Davis, uh, who who basically invented the run-and-shoot offense, which, which he brought to the USFL and which in many ways a lot of – almost every pro football team runs a variation of it now. Mose uh, got his first pro, pro gig in Canada with the Toronto Argonauts in 1982 and really kind of revolutionized offensive football in Canada, certainly in Toronto where the Argos had not had a good offense for most of the past three decades. And with the year Mouse got here – Man, it was like, whoa, we we can throw the ball. We can we can we could do stuff that nobody knew how to stop. So yeah, there's and, and and Bud Grant. Bud Grant led the the Vikings as a head coach, I think, to four Super Bowls or three or four Super Bowls where they lost. But he also won the Great Cup up here as a head coach, I think, three or four times. Uh, so there has been some cross pollination over the years. Doug Flutie, of course, probably the greatest football player in Canadian football history. Of course, he's not Canadian. He, he, he started at Boston College. He played a bit in the USFL. He had a brief taste of of, uh, of coffee in the NFL. Then he came to Canada for eight years and was dominant. And then he went back down to the NFL and he played for another six or seven years down there and played pretty damn well. Uh, we were sorry to lose Doug. We had him at, we had him for his last two years with the Argos and you couldn't stop him. The guy was the guy was the the best weapon I think has ever been set foot on a Canadian football field. He was too good, and Toronto's too close to Buffalo. They saw him and they brought him down to Buffalo, and we lost him. Right, so 
Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, I just remember the Flutie Flakes and everything like that. I That's mean, right. Absolutely. The Hail Mary. Uh, so yeah. you, you, before we get into that season again, and maybe those four characters, you mentioned earlier 1873, I believe it was for the Argos. Yep. Uh, from what I understand, they're the longest standing team with the same city and name in North America. Is that true? Yes, they are the longest, sir, the longest standing gridiron football team in the world, I guess, because there was only gridiron football in North America. It's funny, they're, they're, they're rivals an hour away in Hamilton, the Tiger Cats, try to claim that they are the oldest because I believe they started playing in 1869, but it was the Tigers, and they didn't become the Tiger Cats until 1950 when they merged with the Hamilton Wildcats. So there was no Hamilton Tiger Cats in 1869. There was a Hamilton Tigers, but the Argonauts have been playing under that name and that that those sets of colors, the double blue colors, since 1873. So next year will be the 150th year of it. What is an Argonaut? Well, it's the, the legend of Jason and the Argonauts. It's a rowing. Uh, it's it's rowing. There were the Jason. I don't even really know. It's like a Greek legend about Jason and the Argonauts, and it was something to do with rowing in the water. The Argonauts actually started with that name because it was there's there was this back in now we're talking like in the 1870s, right? A big deal, a recreational pursuit in in well, I think probably all around the world at the time in big cities was uh, was rowing. Uh, and so there was this thing called the Argonaut Rowing Club in Toronto. They would they would go out on on the Humber River, you know, guys in these long boats with 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 ten guys with oars, and they would row and have races and stuff. And to to keep the rowers in shape during the off season, they started playing football. And so it was because the Argonaut Rowing Club, and it's the same club, so we just became the Argonaut Football Club. Uh, so yeah, that's the legend there. Actually, there's a movie called Jason and the Argonauts and uh, I've never seen it. Uh, it's something to do with, with Greek mythology or some, something like that. But, uh, it's, if you, the Argos have a boat on their logo. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a boat that has, that has a football attached to it with sails coming with oars coming out of it and so on. So that's the, that's the story of the Argonauts. Yeah, that's, I mean, I was wondering if it had something to do with on sea because I saw, you know, I went through their website and everything and I saw, like you said, the logo with the football it looked like one of those Greek, I'm going to butcher the name, triremes or something like that, that you see yeah. in those old school boats. Uh, yep, okay, yep. so getting into the 1991 season, the reason why we brought you here, the year, the, the year of the rocket, uh, we kind of covered Rocket Ishmael in length. Is there anything else that you want to cover regarding his his season there? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, he's a, he's a huge part of the story. Uh, the, you know, the, the the books the book title is Year of the Rocket. Uh, John Candy, Wayne Gretzky, a crooked tycoon, and the craziest season of football history. And so there's four four sort of central figures: Rocket, Gretzky, Candy, Bruce McNall uh, are the four kind of main figures. Rockets Rockets really an interesting story because. Number one, you know the, the the crazy contract that was paid to him and the and the outbidding the NFL that alone would be would be newsworthy. But but also the way things unfolded for him over that year and the following year, uh, he was I believe he was probably the fastest player we've ever seen on a Canadian football field. Uh, you know they as as you know Arnie, I mean every football camp. On day one, they all run 40-yard sprints and they time them, right? And everybody, the the how what time did a guy get in the 40 is is the time-honored way of determining how fast players are. So Rocket ran on on the the the, the, the opening day of camp. He was the last guy to run the 40. He he'd been doing a photo session or something, and he he was late getting there. Everybody everybody was done for the day, but nobody left the field. Nobody went to the locker room. Everybody wanted to see the Rocket run his 40-yard time. So he, he gets up there and he and he stretches and warms up and then he runs the time and and coaches and players described to me that like he was so fast you couldn't even hear his footsteps and and they all look you know they're they're up there's six or seven coaches are timing him with their stopwatches and they're all looking at it going like what and and the, the, the finally the the, the the decision was the, the consensus was that his time was 4.21 seconds. There has not been a time that fast in the NFL combine since they went to electronic timing in 1999. So it's absolutely, he was unbelievably fast. Um, and I mean, when his, his first big play in Canadian football, which came in the Argos second game of the year, he, he sat out the first game partly because he was hurt, partly because it was a road game and they kind of wanted to save him for the home game the week later. 
His first big play was a reverse on a punt return where he lined up at the line of scrimmage and then he and then he doubled back to the to the punt returner, a, a really great player named Pinball Clemens. Everybody's converging on Pinball Clemens. He hands the ball to the rocket and he takes off. And man, it was electric how fast. I had never seen a guy run that fast in my life. It was just unbelievable how much speed he, he showed. Uh, so he was an amazing weapon. He also happened to score the most maybe the most famous touchdown in championship history in Canada. I mean, we, our, our championship is the Grey Cup, and the Argos got to the Grey Cup that year. Coldest Grey Cup of all time. It was kind of like the 1967 NFL championship game between Green Bay and Dallas. It was it was frigging cold. And and the, it's, a, it's the fourth quarter. Calgary Stampeders have just scored a touchdown to make it a one-point game. They've got all the momentum. They've been, they've been moving the ball like crazy. The Argos are playing with a quarterback who's badly, badly injured. And then the kickoff, Rocket takes it 87 yards for a touchdown. You know, untouched, it, just like he did in Notre Dame. He saved his biggest plays for the biggest, most important moments. He scores the touchdown that basically gives the Argos the Grey Cup. And as he's about to cross the goal line, a frozen can of beer comes out of the stands and almost hits him, comes, comes really close to hitting him. I mean, it's an iconic moment, not only because of the, you know, the, the touchdown he scored and how important the touchdown it was and who scored it, the rocket, the guy that was that got all the money, but also the beer can. And then things went really south the next year. The part of, a big part of the book is the fact that Rocket was not well suited to do what they needed him to do off the field. They didn't give him four and a half million dollars to be a fast punt returner and, and receiver. They gave him four and a half million dollars to be the Wayne Gretzky of Canadian football, to sell the sport in Toronto and around the, the country and to be so big that you get American TV money and stuff like that. And as great of a player as Rocket was and as great of a teammate as he was, and he absolutely was a good teammate, all of his teammates told me that, he was a shy kid who did not want to be in front of the cameras and the microphones. And they needed him to be in front of the cameras and the microphones all the time. So, so it was... The money was the, the four, most of that four and a half million dollars was to be a salesperson and a marketing guy. And he was not well suited for that. In year two, things really went sour. And there's a, there's another moment in Rockets career that is legendary up here where the team had a bad year after winning the Grey Cup. They're having a they're getting blown out in a game at home against the Calgary Stampeders, the team they beat to win the Grey Cup. A brawl erupts and Rocket stomps on a Calgary Stampeders head. And that moment of him stomping on that guy's head has been played on TV so many times up here. It'll, it'll, it'll be played forever, just like the touchdown and just like the beer can, right? He's remembered for three things. He's remembered for the touchdown, the beer can, and the stomp. It reminds me, so you brought up a couple of memories. As I'm a Detroit Lions fan, and uh, the listener of the show. <laughs> My sympathies, brother. I, I yeah. grew up in London, Ontario, so I followed the Lions when I was a kid. <laughs> so you understand. And yeah. uh, like I said, so the listener of the show is probably uh, nauseous at this point because I talk about it all the time. <laughs> but you reminded me of, first you said shy, and I think of like great athletes. So Barry Sanders, he really didn't, you know, not in the limelight like that. And then the remembering for the stomp and Dominican Sue on, on Aaron Rodgers. That's all everybody remembers him as, but yeah, he's actually right. a really good teammate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but you're right, though. He'll never be forgotten. He'll That will never be forgotten, right? And, I mean, you watch the footage of, of the stomp. It's it's astonishing. I mean, there's this big fight on the sidelines behind the Argo bench, and guys are kind of rolling around on the ground, throwing punches. And Rocket comes in, and he just, just jumps, leaps from above onto this guy's helmet. And luckily the guy had a helmet on because it could have been really serious injury. And actually one of the referees kind of grabbed him by the back of the neck just at the right moment. So may maybe kind of lessened how hard it would have been for him to come down on, on, on Andy McVeigh. Uh, and, and then of course, you know, the other thing that, again, is there's so many elements to the story. So, so he does this and it's like, he got kicked out of the game and it's like, man, like it just couldn't have gone any worse. And of course, this is 1991, 1992. There was no, there was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was no email. There was, there was no websites. There was no way to get your story out, except in Toronto, they had this thing called Speaker's Corner. There was a, there was a local TV channel, City TV, that had this booth outside of their studio where you could go in, you could put in a dollar coin, and you could talk into the microphone, and they would record it. And the best of those got on TV once a week. And so Rocket goes to the booth, and he basically sort of 
sort of apologizes. It wasn't a really a great apology, but he knew he'd done something bad. He knew he had to kind of make it right. So he goes to Speaker's Corner. So the next day on all the TV networks up here, not only is there the stop, but here's Rocket's kind of lame apology as well, right? That's funny. Like you said, I mean, now an athlete can just get in touch with anybody at any point in time real right. easily. He goes to a booth <laughs> has to put yep. a dollar in to put yep. get his, his message out there. So speaking of the Rocket too, before we move on to the great one, there was what I saw considered the, I'm using air quotes here, the greatest halftime show in CFL history that had something to do with Rocket. Can you explain that? That's right. I mean, well, I mentioned earlier that Rocket's debut was in week two. He he sat out week one because they, uh, you know, he had a quad injury. And in fact, it was interesting because there was a lot of grumbling among his teammates at the end of camp. He he basically didn't didn't practice for the last two or three weeks of camp, didn't play the exhibition games. And guys were already starting to question, even though his teammates ultimately liked the guy, they were questioning his commitment. He'd flown down to L.A. Well, they're all in camp doing two a days. He flew down to L.A. and went on Arsenio Hall. And the guy like, what? Like, how can you do that, right? Are you really a part of this team? Or are you just trying to become a celebrity in Hollywood? So they hold him out of the game, the quad injury and, and all that stuff. And part of the reason they held him out of the game was because they had their, their opening game was in week two, the home opener. And that was the biggest event, I think, in Toronto sports history, arguably. I mean, they it was the, the buzz around the building. That was only the third year for Skydome, which, which at the time was considered to be the greatest stadium in the world. It's no longer seen that way. And it was actually a terrible stadium for football, but that's another story. But so they had they had they had, you know, the, the, the debut of everything. Gretzky's there on the sidelines. John Candy's there on the sidelines. McNall's there. Rocket's making his debut. And one of John Candy's best friends, Dan Aykroyd, who, of course, was in the Blues Brothers with the late John Belushi, reformed the band called the Elwood Blues Review because, of course, John was gone. But Jim Belushi was there. Jim Belushi was dancing at halftime with John Candy and with Dan Aykroyd and Mario Hemingway. It was a mega event. It was it was like the biggest thing that could have hit Toronto sports. It was a week after the Major League Baseball All-Star game was played in Toronto. And I, I would say the Argos home opener was a much bigger deal. And that you'd never say that nowadays, right? It just wouldn't happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I can't really speak to that point because I don't know enough about, like you said, how it is, how big CFL is up there compared to, I've mentioned this in a couple episodes of the CFL. We, we were like stuck in our own little world down here with the NFL and everything. And even me, I'd, I don't follow college. So I couldn't tell you how good Trevor Lawrence was really going to be. Well, I mean, that's a whole nother story with the Jaguars, but we'll move on from that one. So you talked about hockey in Toronto. That's a pretty big deal. But so where in the story does the great one, Wayne Gretzky, who is what I know is hockey come into a football story. Yeah. So, you know, Gretzky, of course, is the, he's the greatest, he's the greatest hockey player of all time. There's virtually no, no arguing that you'd be some people that would say Bobby or, uh, but Gretzky, he's, he, I would say he's actually the most dominant athlete in team sports of any kind. I mean, you know, you, you look at the, his numbers, he's, he's had more, he had more assists than anybody else has ever had uh, points uh, you know, his, his records are basically unbeatable. He went down, he was, he played for the Edmonton Oilers for the first 10 years of his career. Uh, and then in 1988, he got lured down to LA by Bruce McNall when uh, Bruce had just bought the Kings and he talked, he talked Peter Pocklington, the owner of the, L, of the Edmonton Oilers into, into trading Wayne Gretzky down to LA. Uh, and then that made a huge difference to the fortunes of, of, the, of hockey forever. You know, hockey was a sport that was basically really big in Canada and really big in pockets of the Northeast U.S., big Detroit, Chicago, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Pittsburgh. Not many other places really followed or paid much attention to hockey. Um, and when Gretzky got to L.A., it became huge in Southern California and really in the Southern United States. Uh, the Kings have been around for 20 years and nobody, nobody cared about them. They were, you know, there's a great famous quote, Jack Kent Cook owned the LA Kings. Jack Kent Cook was a guy from Toronto. He was one of the owners of the LA Kings in the early days. And he had this famous quote where he said, you know, there's 300,000 former Canadians living in LA and I figured out why they're down here. They all hate hockey. And so uh, Gretzky gets there and suddenly everybody loves hockey. Goldie Hawn's at the games, Ronald Reagan's at the games, uh, Schwarzenegger's at the games, Stallone, all those guys are going to sit at the LA Kings games. Uh, and it became, you know, and 
the salaries of hockey players exploded. Gretzky got paid way more money than he ever would have made had he stayed at Edmonton. Uh, so he became kind of Bruce McNall's business partner as well as his star player. Uh, and so one day, Bruce was Bruce was in addition to being you know the owner of the Kings, he was on the board of directors at Hollywood Park Racetrack in Los Angeles. And another guy on the board was a guy named Harry Ornest. And Harry Ornest had owned the Ar Argonauts for, for the past two years. Uh, he'd been the former owner of the St. Louis Blues, and after he sold the Blues, he was like not quite ready to retire. So the Argos became available. He bought them. He owned them for two years, and then he kind of got sick of commuting back and forth, and he was getting kind of old. And he, so he said to Bruce one day at Hollywood Park, uh, I got this football team in Canada, you, the Argonauts. Do you want to buy it? And Bruce told me, you know, I'd never even heard of the Argos. I knew nothing about them. But he knew that Wayne, his, his, his friend and star player and business partner, had grown up not far from Toronto. He grew up in Brantford, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half outside Toronto. So he phones up Wayne and says, hey, I'm, you know, the Argonauts are available. What do you think? And Gretzky says, oh, man, like there's only one football team worth owning in Canada, Bruce. It's the Toronto Argonauts. Uh, and uh, then... Uh, McNall calls John Candy, who was the honorary captain of the LA Kings. Uh, it was, again, John's from Toronto. John grew up in Toronto and he was a big hockey fan, but also a huge Argo fan. McNall says, hey, I'm thinking of buying the Argos. What do you think? And Candy's eyes lit up. It's like, you got to be kidding me, man. I love that team. I wanted to play for that team when I was a kid. We got to do this, Bruce. We got to do it. So that's how the three of them got involved. Gretzky was kind of the the least involved of the three because he was still playing hockey. He had, a, you know, during during the football season, he's playing hockey for a big part of it. So he was up for the first game and he came up, he came up to the Grey Cup that year um, and he came to a few other games. But uh, it was really more more candy that that took on the ownership reins. Uh, Gretzky was kind of I wouldn't want to call him the silent partner, but he was he was the least involved of the three. Uh, but having his name attached to it, along with Candy, I mean, these guys are basically, I would say, the two biggest stars that Canada has ever produced. I mean, Gretzky's the greatest hockey player of all time, maybe the greatest athlete of all time. And John Candy is the greatest funny man of all time. Uh, everybody around the world who, who's ever seen a John Candy film or SCTV loves the guy. So, you know, take, you know, Uncle Buck, planes, trains and automobiles. You get that. You get uh, you get Gretzky. It's like going to be a magical thing. And for that year, it was a magical ride. Yeah, I mean, you, okay, you touched on Gretzky and okay, it all makes sense now because of Bruce McNall. But why did you in the title call him the crook, the crooked tycoon <laughs> or whatever it was? The crooked tycoon. Yeah, I, I mean, that well, it was the publisher, my publisher that came up with the title, but I think it is a good title. Bruce, Bruce was... A guy when he came when 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 he bought the Argos he was the majority partner when they when they bought the team in '91, everybody around the sporting community thought Bruce McNall was like a guy with a Midas touch that everything he touched turned to gold. He'd he'd started he'd earned his fortune by by trading and collecting ancient coins and somehow he turned that into becoming a wealthy enough guy to buy the L.A. Kings when they weren't worth all that much, frankly. So it wasn't it wasn't you know it wasn't like they are now. Uh, and everybody just thought, man, he brought Gretzky down and this hockey interest exploded. He got the NHL to expand. They got a team in Anaheim and he got half of the half of the franchise fee as a as like a finder's fee. Bruce is like a genius, right? What nobody knew at the time, and they didn't find out until around the around the end of the three years that he and, and Gretzky and Candy were involved with the Argos. So it was all built on fraud. Bruce, Bruce had this thing where he was, he was, he was basically. Uh, tricking investors and banking firms and lending agencies out of millions and millions of dollars by by faking his assets. Uh, he, he 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 pretended he had he had the world's greatest sports memorabilia collection by showing bank people thousands and thousands of worthless pro set hockey cards and pretending and passing them off as being worth a lot. Uh, he, he he borrowed. A, a baseball signed by Babe Ruth and and threw it to a to an investor and said, "Hey, look at this Babe Ruth baseball that I own." He didn't own it; it was somebody else's. So Bruce was playing with other people's money, and in the end, he ended up going to prison for six years. He 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 was convicted of, of defrauding banks to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars, like two hundred sixty three million dollars in fraud, and so. That's why he's the crooked tycoon. There's a great quote in the book from one of his ex-wives. She says, 
He's very charming and very crooked. And he is. He's incredibly charming. Like Gretzky still loves him. People that work with him still love the guy. But and Bruce is the first guy to admit all the stuff he did. He 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 can't help himself from talking about it. He did it all. He acknowledges it. He went to jail. He he scammed the prison system. You know, he got he got Wayne Gretzky and Luke Robitaille to bring signed hockey sticks to give to the guards so he could get special treatment. He eventually faked an alcohol addiction so he could get moved to a minimum security prison. Bruce is a Bruce is a real operator, but he's one of the nicest, charming guys you're ever going to meet. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know anything about any of that story. And I mean, I did again. Most of that I didn't know about. I heard, okay, yeah, he went to prison, but I didn't realize that there how he got into all of this. And John Candy is the last kind of character you touched on. It. He wanted to grow up and play for the Argonauts. I mean, so was he like a lifelong fan type deal then? Absolutely. He, or he, he, he grew up in Toronto. He, he grew up in uh, in a little uh, part of Toronto, not far from the, the center of the city called East York. Went to a high school called Neil McNeil High School where he played football on the offensive line. He fantasized about playing for the Argonauts. And, of course, John was a big man, right? He was like 6'5". And, you know, he, his weight as an adult fluctuated between 275 and 350. But he could have played on the offensive line as a pro football athlete conceivably. He blew out a knee, so that ruined that dream. But he went to he went to Argo Games as a kid at an old exhibition stadium. He absolutely loved the team. And when he heard from Bruce that that you know there was a chance to get involved, he was he was all in. And it's you know I mentioned that the Argos being 150 years old almost, they've had a lot of owners over the years. You know from the rowing club through all kinds of private corporations and individuals. Only one owner of the Argonauts loved the Argos the way John Candy did. And that was John Candy. He loved it. He was, he was heart and soul. And that year of 1991, he was all in. He put his acting career on hold. He was a, he was a major, major star, right? Uncle Buck had trains, planes, and automobiles had been two giant box office hits. And he was making well over a million dollars for starring roles in movies, which, which doesn't sound like that much now, but it was a lot, a lot of money back at 30 years ago. Uh, he could kind of write his own ticket to movies that he wanted to be in. He put that completely on hold to become the owner of the Argos and to do everything. He went, he went to every road game the team did that year. He, he Not only would he go on the road with the team, but he'd get there the, a day early. and He'd go to every single radio station in Regina or Winnipeg or Calgary from 5 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock, on every, make the rounds, Come out for tomorrow night, folks. Buy tickets. Buy tickets. We're going to lift this blackout. We get Canadian football's growing. We need you there. Uh, with the players, they loved him. He got to know every player on that team. One player offhandedly one day said, man, I sure love a cappuccino. The next day, there's a cappuccino machine in the locker room. He flew some players home from games on his private jet with, like, you know, one of them describes there are 15 different forks and knives and, you know, cut crystal glasses and, you know, the best, the most greatest assortment of food you can ever imagine and he's just doing sctv characters all the way home from from regina you know john was and he and he was the chairman of the league's expansion committee and and he basically helped save the league because they were in bad bad shape as i said i mean it was you know there's one of these really bizarre ironies is that the argos launched their season in 1991 in ottawa against the rough riders you know, the, it was supposed to be the debut of the Rocket, but he didn't play that game. But it was the debut of Candy and McNall, and the whole circus began. Three weeks later, the Ottawa Rough Riders declared bankruptcy, and the and the league had to take over operations of the team. And John Candy found them a new owner, guy from guys from your from your neck of the woods, from from Detroit, the Gleiberman family, Lonnie and Bernie Gleiberman. They wanted to get an expansion franchise for Detroit because because Lonnie grew up watching. CFL games on the, the TV stations in Windsor across the border from Detroit. And uh, he was looking to get an expansion franchise and Candy convinced him, look, buy the Ottawa Rough Riders. It's a great, great city. It's got a ton of history. We need an owner there. And so they bought, they bought into the team and that helped save that franchise. Eventually, the next couple of years, the league actually expanded into the U.S. They had three years where they had teams based in the United States, 93, 94, and 95. And that was fundamentally driven by the, 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 Desires of the McNall Gretzky Candy Group to grow the league, and by John Candy's leadership of the expansion process, and that whole thing was really run through John. Again, I, I had no idea about how involved they were, especially John. It sounds like, and you know, for my generation, I again, I think of him just as that funny guy in the TV. I didn't realize he had anything to do with football. 
Uh, he okay, so we're gonna pull this DeLorean back up again, right? <laughs> yeah. And this time you are gonna go in the DeLorean because I can tell you also seem to be a fan, and from what I understand, you would maybe consider yourself an Argonaut historian. Uh, take me back to the first first Argonaut moment that you really remember being young and saying, "Wow, I'm like I'm all in on this thing." Uh, yeah, I can I can distinctly remember it, Arnie. I mean, I was. It's funny, you know. I as a kid, I didn't actually follow sports at all till I was about ten years old. I just for some reason I had no interest in sports. My dad was a big fan, but I just didn't. I just didn't care. Um, unlike most Canadian boys, I didn't. I didn't play hockey. I didn't really learn how to skate as a kid. I was a terrible skater. I sort of tried to learn as an adult, but I was never much on skates. Um, and so I just wasn't into it. I just didn't really care. I was into, I was collecting Superman comics and, and I was really into music. I grew up in the sixties and radio was fantastic in the sixties. You know, AM radio was just so one great song after another, but I remember in 1968, I got into the Toronto Argonauts and they were my dad's favorite team. So that didn't hurt. But I remember seeing the Argonauts, watching an Argonauts game at a friend of mine at his uncle's place. And I thought, man, these they're cool. Like I, you can keep in mind, I was born in 57. So I, when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, it was, it was 64. I was six years old. And like from the moment I saw that, that first Beatles performance and I wanted long hair. I want, I was, I got into that sort of, you know, that kind of mentality, even as a six year old and the Argonauts in 1968, were the first adults that I'd ever seen who weren't musicians who had long hair. They had a they had a band of renegades that were on that team. Leo Cahill was the coach and general manager, and he 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 brought in all these wild. They were kind of like the L.A. Raiders of Canadian football. They were they were rough and mean, and he didn't care if they had mustaches and beards and hair sticking out the back of their helmet. I remember seeing guys with the hair sticking out of the back of their helmet. I thought, oh, that's so cool. And then, and then I fell in love with the color scheme, the double blue colors, light blue and dark blue. It's an Oxford blue and Cambridge blue to be specific. And I just loved them ever since. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I, that, that's my time, 1968. They were in the middle of what became a 31 year drought, a championship drought, kind of like the Lions are in now. It was Lions is worse, right? And I hate, don't, I don't, didn't mean to bring up a yeah, bad yeah, memory. Let's not, let's not bring yeah. any of that. I'm going to press but that, leave this imagine conversation. Though, but, but imagine though, Artie, what it's going to be like when the Lions finally do win the championship. How crazy Detroit's going to go? That's yeah, what we thought, yeah, we thought the city burned a couple of years ago or whatever it was. Yeah, it's going to burn down to the ground. <laughs> well, hopefully they will. People will treat it with respect, but people will be so happy because it's like this. There's this huge pressure valve, like year after year after year of following the team, and they never win. And and I don't know. I mean, I I can't speak exactly to the Lions because, but I because I know that some years they're just bad. But and some and certainly some years in that 31 years, the Argos were just bad. But Actually, you know, the title of my first book, which is about the 83 Argos, is Bouncing Back from National Joke to Grey Cup Champs. And they were a national joke. I mean, they would find ridiculously crazy ways to lose. You know, they, they'd, they'd be, it'd be the last day of the season, and you're going to get in the playoffs if you just lose the game by 15 points, and they would lose by 16 points. They do that sort of stuff. And so there was this huge amount of pressure building in the fan base, like to win, to win. We, when are we finally going to win? When are we finally going to win? And when they finally did win in 83, it was a ex- great moment of exhilaration. But in some ways, it might have been the worst thing that ever happened because interest started dropping off right after that. It was almost like, OK, finally, now we can follow the Blue Jays and now we can start looking at the NFL because now there's more games coming in on TV. And eventually the Raptors got into Toronto. And, you know, it, there's been all this stuff that has made the Argos less important than they were back in the 70s uh, and even into the early 80s. But but it it was it was that seeing those guys with the long hair and those cool colors. And I just, I got, I got hooked. And then about a decade later, I got really serious about it. I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be a fan. I'm going to be a serious fan. I'm going to document this team. So I started clipping the stories out of newspapers and saving programs and media guides. And that's become just an insane 45 year obsession of, of collecting paper and junk. As soon as I got my first VCR back in 83, I started taping every game and not only games though, taping like sports casts with, with segments on the Argos and stuff. Some of which came in incredibly handy. I didn't know that 30 years later, I was going to do this book about 91, but I've got 
hundreds of hours of footage from of that team back in 91 as part of the research material. I mean, I also interviewed 100 plus people and I, I, I brought a whole lot of journalistic rigor to the task, but having access to all this cool content and now I'm starting to roll it out by making it available on YouTube and people are going, wow, like I don't, I don't remember that or I never saw that before. I was too young and I can't believe it was like that back then, right? So, so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, again, you, I can tell you have that distinct passion for it. And I didn't, again, going way back and having all this extra collection that you have there. I was going to ask the question, and I don't even know if I should rephrase this, but why now write the book about 1991 and why you? Well, um, I'll tell you the story. I mean, so I, I worked as a journalist uh, for my whole career. Well, I, I worked in journalism. I, I was a journalist for most of the time, mostly as an editor. I did a, I did some a couple of years of full time reporting, but most of my time in newsrooms was as an editor uh, and a newsroom manager and supervisor. And then the last eleven years of my career, I ended up I made a kind of a weird U turn where they they the same company. I worked for Canadian Press, which was the Canada's national news agency. It's like the Canadian equivalent of the Associated Press, so it serves news to everybody else, right? To all the newspapers and radio and TV stations and websites and so on. And they 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 came to me and said, we want you to be the head of the human resources operation. So I did that for the last 11 years of my career. Uh, and then there was a change in ownership. It was a it was a, it's a long story, but the company's ownership changed. And as a result of the ownership change, they didn't need me to be the HR person anymore. They so I got I got a, a package to leave. Uh, after 31 years. And it was because I'd been there for 31 years and I was in a senior role. It was a generous package. And one day I was out riding my bike, you know, thinking, what am I going to do next? I'm still only in my early fifties. I got lots of, I got lots of energy left. What, what's next for me. And I do often, often do my best thinking, riding the bike and just, just pumping my legs and really letting, you know, the endorphins flow and all that. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to read a book about the 1983 Argonauts. Uh, that's the team that broke the 31-year jinx. I, I became a season ticket holder in 81. I moved from London to Toronto in 1980, and I became a season ticket holder in 81. And it, interestingly enough, in 81, it was the worst team in franchise history. They were 2-14, and 14, but they had a whole pile of really good guys and really good players who two years later won the championship. So it was a real rags to riches kind of a story arc. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to read that story. No one's going to write the book. I'll do it. I, I got time on my hands and I got, they're paying me a salary for a while while I, while I get to work through my severance. So I reached out to some players on the team. And the next thing I knew, I was interviewing, you know, some legendary Argonauts like Condridge Holloway and Terry Greer and Cedric Minter and Paul Pearson. And, and I, I wrote this book and it came out in 80, in 2013 to mark the 30th anniversary of the 83 championship team. And I knew back then, you know, as great of a story and as mu much as I love that 83 team, nothing is going to top 91. So I had it in the back of my mind way back even in 2013. I got to do a book about 91. Um, as it happened, the, writing the book about the 83 team got me a commission to write a, to write a book. Somebody paid me to write a book. And I put that money into an account to pay for the cost of doing this one. So I had, I had the money to pay for an editor and a, and a transcriber and, and all the places I had to fly to do interviews and all that stuff was, was funded by the book that I wrote as a result of writing that first book. And I'm the right guy to do it because, I mean, obviously I'm passionate about it and I've got this incredible archive. No, there's no one on the world in the world that's got as much stuff as I do about the Argos. I, I know that there's videos sitting in my basement that don't exist anywhere else because the networks didn't even archive a lot of that stuff. So, I mean, who else, who better, right? A journalist who who followed the team with the, with the passion of a, of a diehard fan, but knows how to do, do journalism and how to get information from people and get them to talk. Uh, and has access to a treasure trove of archival material. So, and then now, 20th, 30th anniversary, just like the one in 83, 91 is the 30th, or 21 is the 30th anniversary of, of 91. So there's your reason. Oh, that's, yeah, that's perfect tying it all again. I I mean, geez, I, you go into these interviews sometimes, and I guess from a journalistic perspective, you don't know what you're going to get yourself into because like this one right here, I, I knew nothing about it. I was trying to figure out the best way to go. And it's like, holy crap, I'm smacked in the face with all this <laughs> wealth of information. So I'm going to ask you a smack in the face moment, two of sure, them, sure. with your interviews. What was the, I mean, okay, if you, as a, as a lifelong fan, what was the, per, or who was the most, you were awestruck by like, wow, I can't believe I'm interviewing this person for my book. 
Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I guess Gretzky, right? I mean, just because he's so huge in Canada. I, I thought Wayne would be a very tough person to get to speak to me. Um, he's, you know, he doesn't know me. I've never, I mean, I've actually, you know, it's funny. I, I said I'd been a reporter for a couple of years back in the 80s. And I was based in Calgary, which is just down the highway from Edmonton. And I, I did get to cover a whole lot of Calgary Flames hockey games, including some really fantastic games against the Edmonton Oilers when the two teams were the were the two best teams at hockey. So, I mean, I've been in I've been in the Edmonton Oilers locker room a few times way back then. But I was I was a wire service guy. Wayne didn't know who I was. I was just one of the faces in the scrum. He wouldn't have remembered me. So I didn't know that I was going to be able to get Wayne and, and, and getting him was was a real a really happy moment uh and he and he was very insightful unfortunately it was only over the phone and i only had 20 minutes with him i would have loved a longer period of time would have loved a face-to-face because you can really draw people out and you can you can go into deep deep nooks and crannies when you've got an hour or two with somebody and sitting sitting with you uh but i guess that one's the, the one i mean but you know the, 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 frankly some some of the guys that that you know weren't even big stars but who gave who gave amazing stories i mean you know there was a there was a guy on that uh, team he was the assistant equipment he wasn't even he was he was he was an equipment assistant he wasn't even the equipment manager he wasn't even the assistant equipment manager he was an equipment assistant a guy named jason calero amazing stories from jason um, you know, it's, it's, I, I treated everybody as someone who, who could help me get to the bottom of this amazing story and do justice to it. And almost all of them really helped a lot. Everybody had unique perspectives. Um, and throughout the course of the book, almost everybody I spoke to, their voice gets in there at some point with something very worthwhile to say. Um, so I guess, I guess that would, that would be the way I'd answer the question. I mean, it's, you know, as a fan, you kind of, one thing that, that maybe is different than up here than it is in, in the NFL is that we have access to players, right? The Canadian football is still pretty small and, and guys don't make a ton of money and you can, I mean, you go to the great cup every year. Uh, it's, 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 it's the equivalent of going to the super bowl, except you go to the great cup and there's all these parties and Hey, there's the quarterback of the Hamilton tiger cats. And I can go and buy him a beer. Right. And he'll and he'll talk to me for an hour that they are way more down to earth. They're they're like they're like fans. They're they're all part of one big family. So, I mean, I'd met Pinball Clemens a number of times. He's a legendary Argonaut. Uh, talking to Matt Dunnigan was pretty cool. Matt Dunnigan was the quarterback, the guy who played the great cup with a, with a, uh, a fractured clavicle and his throwing arm. One of the I think the most heroic performance in great cup history uh, to, to play when you basically can't lift your arm and you, and you had to get a shot full of painkillers. Uh, through two touchdown passes anyway. Um, so that's pretty cool to talk to people like that. But I also really enjoy talking to the, I, you know, the equipment manager and the, and the trainer and, and assistant coaches and, and backup players who had really unique insights to offer. Um, it was just everybody I spoke to had brought a lot of value to the project. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been privileged to do it. I, I said to people, I feel like I've got a solemn obligation to do justice to this amazing story. And you're, by speaking to me, you're helping me do that. I'd like to think I did do justice to the story. I hope I did. I, I feel good about the book. It's getting good. People are saying good things about it. So that's great. Um, I'd like to talk to some of those people I interviewed and hear what they think. I hope some of them would say, yeah, you nailed it, buddy. And Matt, Matt Dunnigan did say that. His quote was, you nailed it. So that's that was very encouraging. Uh, for my reference, who is Matt Dunn? I can't pronounce the last name. Matt Dunnigan. So he was the quarterback. He was he. Matt Dunnigan came out of Louisiana Tech. He broke Terry Bradshaw's records at Louisiana Tech, uh, and he was too short to play quarterback in the NFL back in those days when they were looking for six foot three guys who stood in the pocket. Matt Dunnigan was. Uh, six feet tall, maybe I think he was five eleven, and he didn't stay in the pocket. He took off and he barreled, he barreled into linebackers. He was the toughest quarterback I've ever seen. Uh, and he became a legend up in Canada. He played for a bunch of teams up here. He took several teams to the great cup. He, he led the Argonauts to the championship in 91. And in, in what I think is his greatest moment of glory. Uh, if, if, if he was coming out of school nowadays, Matt Dunnigan would be in the NFL because they now like the kind of quarterback that Matt Dunnigan was in those days, the NFL didn't like that kind of quarterbacks. And we were the lucky beneficiaries of that. We got the Doug Fluties and the Damon Allens and the Conridge Holloways and the Matt Dunnigans and even the Warren Moons because the NFL, well, the NFL didn't like black quarterbacks for a long time, which is really appalling. I'm glad they're past that. Uh, but they also didn't like running quarterbacks. They didn't like small quarterbacks. They didn't like mobile quarterbacks. Now, they got Russell Wilson. They got they got Lamar Jackson. They, you know they they love all that stuff that we that we kind of put the we had the patent on up here for many years. 
So Matt was a legend. He came. He was actually Warren Moon's replacement. When Warren left the, the Edmonton Eskimos after six seasons to go and become an NFL star and a guy that ended up being in both the Canadian and the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, his replacement was Matt Dunigan. Uh, and then he got to the Argos six years later, and you know, then Matt became a giant part of the story, obviously. Matt, Matt's a, worth guy, a guy worth looking up. You should look at some of his highlights online because he played he played quarterback like a linebacker. You you, you want to tackle Matt, you better be ready for him to ram right into you. <laughs> you know, he like, not, none of that sliding crap for Matt Dunnigan, I'll tell you. He sounds like, okay, with the new wave Detroit Lions, the whole we're going to come up and bite your kneecaps. Like, he sounds like our style of quarterback that we want nowadays. Matt, so. Matt could probably join the Lions today and still be a pretty good quarterback in that league. You know, he's he had some concussions, <laughs> unfortunately, so that really did affect him but but Matt is Matt is still cut and he I bet you he could throw a throw a 50 50 yard pass on a rope right now well, well maybe we'll get him on the show sometime <laughs> down the road as well there you go uh, speaking of getting people on the show and you have these interviews so let's go back to the one story I mean there's a million of them I'm sure but the one story that really blew your socks off like whoa I did not expect that well, I think in, in a way it actually it was it was when when Gretzky told me about how he and he and John Candy were given marching orders from Bruce McNall. You guys got it. You got to explain to Rocket how he's going to deal with the media like they 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 made like, you know, I, I'd known that Rocket was not comfortable talking to journalists. That was obvious even back then. Uh, but I hadn't known that the team itself was was caught off guard by that, and they were. They did not do their due diligence. They they were right. Rocket was Rocket had seemingly all the attributes you'd want. He was a fantastic player with amazing speed. You know, Bill Wall said he had the best functional football speed he'd ever seen. A guy who could not only run fast but could make plays out of fast speed. Uh, he had a fantastic nickname, Rocket. Look, how could you get a better nickname than Rocket? Good-looking guy, went to Notre Dame, giant following and, and throughout um, football fans in North America. All those things, he ticked every one of those boxes. But they never bothered to see, is this guy going to be wanting to talk to the press? Is he going to be wanting to be talking to, to our sponsors? And they found out pretty early on, he didn't like that stuff. And so very early on, Bruce said to Wayne, you and John have got to talk. you got to explain this to him. you got to train him how to do it, basically. So Wayne said he and John sat down with him and, and Rocket basic guys, like, it's not that I don't want to. I just don't know how. I've never done it before, which, as it turned out, wasn't quite true because I talked to the guy that ran PR at Notre Dame. And, yeah, Rocket had been exposed to the press before. He'd, he'd, when he wanted to do it, he could do it really well. He just didn't want to do it. So that was a big eye opener to hear Gretzky talking about that. That that's the first time anybody's reported that, and and that was a big one. There were other, there were some small ones. I mean, there was, you know, there. I, I was trying to untangle the the mysteries of the financing of the of how it all went down, uh, because you know when they bought when McNall, Gretzky, and Candy bought the team, the story was they paid five million dollars for it, which doesn't sound like anything, and obviously compared to what franchises go for nowadays, it isn't much. But at the time, it was for five million dollars with Bruce being in for 60%, which would be 3 million, Wayne for 20% at a million and John at 20% for a million. And so I was trying to find out, okay, you know, did, was, did money actually change hands and so on? And I, I'd seen enough things and heard enough things to lead me to believe that I actually don't think Bruce McNall, you know, the guy that, the guy that was the, the crooked tycoon, as it turned out, I don't think he put up any money up front at all. I think, I think John Candy and Wayne Gretzky actually wrote checks for a million dollars Harry Ornest, who who Bruce, who they bought it from, got a check for $2 million from those two guys, a million dollars each from those two guys, and Bruce owed him the rest. And then, as it, so I asked Harry Ornest's kids, well, look, how much money did, did your dad get? Harry's long dead, unfortunately, but how much money did your dad actually get for the sale of the Argonauts? And and uh, Mike Ornest said he thought it was about $2 million. And I said, oh, well, that's how much he got from, from Wayne and John. And and then he, then they explained to me how, and I had I had access to some of Harry Ornest's files, which were quite fascinating reading. You know, he, he'd written he'd written a letter to Bruce McNall in the mid, mid-90s after the deal had already, like five or six years after the deal, saying, okay, you still owe me this much money and you owe me this many shares of Hollywood Park and this much in cash and blah, blah, blah. So I asked Mike Ornest, okay, so like, do you know what your dad ended up with? I know exactly how much he ended up with because I've still got a copy of the check out of the bankruptcy proceedings. So McNall, while he was in prison, he went bankrupt. And 
the estate of Harry Ornest, because by then Harry was dead, got 9.80% of what was owing to him. He got, he got less than 10 cents on the dollar. So that was pretty, pretty interesting to see that, right? And Harry got stiffed by Bruce, basically. So that finding that kind of stuff out was really cool. Yeah, definitely. The behind the scenes stuff that doesn't really necessarily make the papers. And I'm going to give you one last DeLorean question here. So this is not just the 1991 Argonauts. This is you can go back to any point in Argonaut history. Oh, man. Not just when you were around. Yeah. And you can like live that moment. You can be there in the huddle. You can be on the sidelines with the coach, whatever it is. What moment are you going to? I think it would be, believe it or not, it would be from 91. Uh, it would be the inter the pregame introductions for the Grey Cup in Winnipeg. I was watch I was in my 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 rec room in Edmonton, Alberta, watching it on TV with my kids. I didn't go to the game that year, and I had absolute goosebumps going up my spine because the Argos did something that day that I'd never seen before. You know, in the old days when when players got introduced before a big game, you know, they would say, you know. At at uh, at left tackle, Alex Karras, and then Alex would come trotting out, and he would stand in a spot for a few seconds, and he'd go running off and join his teammates over on the center of the field. Right? Everybody, there was a sort of a script of how they always followed. They always just kind of jogged on, looked at the camera, then ran off, and that's how the Calgary Stampeders got introduced. But when the Argos, when it came time to introduce the Argos, you know, they introduced the starting defense and they, and, and this, you got to remember, this was in Winnipeg. First of all, it's incredibly cold. It's the coldest great cup of all time. And Winnipeg hated the Argos. They were their rivals in the, they, the Argos prevented Winnipeg from playing in the great cup in their home stadium that, that season by beating them the week before. And they had a huge rivalry. They'd met in the playoffs five years in a row. So there was a lot of hatred in, in Winnipeg for Toronto. And they also didn't like the fact that the Argos were buying the great cup and all that stuff. So, the, the like 51,000 people in the stadium and 50 or 50,000 of them hated the Argos. So when it comes time to introduce, you know, the Eastern division champion, Toronto Argonauts, the booze start, and uh, they introduce, you know, you know, at, at left end uh, de- defensive end, Rodney Harding, and or actually with Brian Warren, the, one of the defensive ends gets introduced first. And Brian Warren is this, he's a guy who's got this really mean, fierce look on his face. He's got his helmet off. And he, and he stands there and he looks around the stadium and he lifts his helmet up and then he starts walking really, really slowly onto the field. And the next guy does the same thing. And they're walking like they're practically standing still. They're not, they're hardly moving. The fans are just booing like crazy. One of them gets up there and he's, he, he holds his helmet up and he, and he points to the A on the helmet, like to like, as if to say to all those fans, like, screw you. And it just got louder and more intense. And as I'm watching this in my rec room, I said to my two kids who were like six and eight years old at the time, I said, like, there's no way we're losing this game. Like, they're so confident. We are so freaking confident. There's no way we're losing the game. So I would have loved to experience that in real life. I would have loved to have been in that stadium and be and to hear 50,000 people booing and to feel as excited as I would have felt to see my guys coming out and walking so dead slow like as if the whole world is against us. Now it's kind of almost like a wrestling type maneuver or something, right? But in those days it was new. Nobody else had ever done anything like that. And it just, I honestly, I just, I knew, I knew we were not losing that game. There was no chance we were going to lose that game based on the pregame introductions. So that's my DeLorean moment. There you go. No, that's a great DeLorean moment. And again, so that we kind of started at the beginning and you perfect to give me a good transition went all the way to the end of the season. So where can people find this book? If they're, I mean, if they haven't been introduced yeah. enough to, it and they want to get the rest of the story. Well, it's available for sale everywhere. You can buy books uh, uh, in the States. You can, you can order it through Barnes and Noble. You can order it through Amazon. Uh, although Amazon's got a little bit of a, of a wonky thing happening right now. So I'd say if you, if you really want to get your hands on it, I would say go to Barnes Noble or you can go to the publisher. My, the publisher is, is a company called Sutherland House and they will fill orders in Canada and the U.S. Uh, and they're fast. They ship very quickly. 
uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I always try to put in a plug for small independent bookstores, right? I, I, we, you know, we love the chains, you know, Barnes and Noble in the States and up here in Canada, it's chapters Indigo, but I love my local small guy. We're just running one store in here in Burlington, Ontario. It's a different drummer. A lot of cities across North America have small independent booksellers. They probably don't have the book in stock, but if you ask them for it, they will be able to get it. And I'd like to tell people I think it's worth it. It's this book's not just football. It's football. It's business. It's culture. It's celebrity. It's entertainment. It's crazy stuff happened. There's I mean we barely scratched the surface of some of the, the craziness from that year. So yeah, by all means check it out. Uh, if you want it, you can you can reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at pxw13. And if you do, if you go onto YouTube, I've I've set up a, a YouTube channel devoted to uh, to this this project. Search Year of the Rocket on YouTube, and you'll find my channel. And there's hundreds and hundreds of very cool videos from back then on there. And there's going to be more. I've got I got loads more in the bank still to come in the in the coming days and weeks. Yeah, perfect. And we'll leave links to all that stuff in the show notes and to your book as well. So with that. Any last gridiron knowledge nuggets for or Argo nuggets that you'd like to give to the listener of the show? Well, I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, we we've been around for a long time with the Argos, and we've got we've got a, a fame our famous chant, which is funny because it it sounds it can sound both sad and excited, but if you're true Argo fans would would know what this means. Argos, you go to an Argo game and you're going to hear that a lot, right? So there you go. There you go. Argos. What'd you think about that story? What he called the craziest season of football history. In fact, that's the title of his book. Well, part of it. His book is The Year of the Rocket. John Candy, Wayne Gretzky, a crooked tycoon in the craziest season of football history. To get the whole story, you got to go out and get a copy of his book. You can find them at most of your bookstores out there, like he said. And if you want to help support the Sports History Network, we do have an Amazon link on the show notes page, which again, we are an affiliate and the network does get a portion of the sale, helping us produce this show and all the other shows on the network. And if you want your chance to win that autographed copy of the book, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Now, next episode, we're going to hop on a plane. We're going to head south. Wait a second. Hop on a plane. I got a DeLorean, man. This is number two. We're going to go Where we're going, we don't need roads. We're going to go down south, 950 miles, to Atlanta, Hotlanta, and chat with Clayton Truder about a book called Loserville. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sports history books pick up your copy today soundtrack provided by kevin mcleod of filmmusic.io